And Bob, I'm so grateful as, that you're able to join us tonight. Also, uh, Gary Moak, who's one of the top clinicians uh, in the community here in Westboro in his own practice, but he's also the director of our geriatric psychiatry program here at UMass. Uh, Gary's also a national leader in geriatric psychiatry by all the psychiatrists in the country elected him to be their president. And he's uh, so a leader in policy in addition to his terrific teaching ability for all of the residents. Uh, I'm the chair of the Department of Psychiatry here at, U at UMass. We're, uh, I'm, I have the honor to uh, work and serve for 300 faculty and 2,000 staff. We have practice all over central Massachusetts and throughout the state, uh, both in the public sector and the state, the new state hospital that's going up the Worcester uh, Recovery Center and hospital, as well as uh, throughout with the UMass Memorial Programs, Community Health Link, and its many terrific programs. So I want to welcome you to, uh, for the calendar year of 2012, our first uh, spring Be Mentally Well program. We do this twice a year. If you've signed in, we'll make sure to keep you on our email list and uh, let you know when the fall uh, event occurs. We also have weekly grand rounds, is the fancy word this doctors use, where people are able to come from the community to our grand rounds, and there are different topics. You could access that on our website, but like today's event, they have top people from all over the uh, country on a variety of topics. I want to also uh, recognize, and if Ann Harstein is here, if she could uh, stand. Uh, Ann is the Secretary of the Executive Office of Elder Affairs here for the state. And I really want to be uh, appreciative that you took you out of your busy schedule to hustle over here and, and join us tonight. We. Uh, I'm sure there may be people who will speak to you afterward, but thank you, uh, Anne, for coming. I want to also thank Laura Meyer. Laura, if you could stand up, please. Laura is really uh, the backbone of our project uh, and puts all the programs together. She has an amazing staff with Diana Langford and all the other teams that members that sort of checked you in when you came in. Uh, we're also grateful when the media can be here and want to thank TNG and appreciate all their uh, attentiveness to these important topics. I want to also thank NCTV for their attendance uh, today. So if you don't want to be on TV, don't say anything. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so now that I've allowed enough people to also come in, I'm going to um, hand it over to Dr. Moak to, uh, or who's, who's going to kick it off? Oh, OK, yes. So actually, look, look Bob and I are co-chairs and really working together on a center of excellence in neuroscience and Bob represents the Department of Neurology here and all of its terrific work both in clinical research and teaching and uh, it's a great pleasure to, to do any work together with you and an honor and uh, really uh, looking forward to your presentation and welcoming. Uh, thank, thank you Doug. I, I simply also wanted to add my voice uh, to his to, to say welcome to everyone. It's uh, wonderful that you could make time to be with us. This is an incredibly important topic and I think it uh, will be a useful review of the topic. Um, I want to particularly thank not only Doug but also Dr. Moak and their uh, staff for all they've done to organize this event and uh, again to thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thanks Bob. And it may be just the using this. Okay. Well, my name is Laura Myers, and it's my pleasure also to welcome you all and thank you to, uh, for coming to our fourth Be Mentally Well community program. And I also wanted to th um, say a thank you to Sharon, uh, f who is the executive producer of NCTV 11, the Northbridge Community Television Station that will be broadcasting this evening, and to Susan Spence, a welcome from the Worcester Telegram and Gazette. A quick housekeeping detail is the uh, restrooms are out either side uh, of the exit doors. And you've been given evaluation forms, and we would sincerely appreciate if you would complete them before you leave. It really makes a difference uh, in terms of us doing better, and we always strive to do better, because as humans, we can always do better. And so we really would appreciate your feedback. 
There will be time for questions at the conclusion of all the presentations. And I hope you didn't miss the exhibits that were downstairs. People came and did a really terrific job setting up some of the community resources that are available. And when you come to the next Be Mentally Well program, make sure you leave time, because there are always exhibits that begin at 5.30. Our evening begins with Dr. Gary Moak. Dr. Moak graduated from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. He completed his residency in psychiatry and his fellowship in geriatric psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Moak is currently the clinical associate professor of psychiatry and director of the geriatric psychiatry training program at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and a geriatric psychiatrist practicing in Westboro, Mass, where he directs the Moak Center for Healthy Aging. What a great title, huh? Healthy Aging. The spe this specialized center is a group practice that treats many patients with Alzheimer's disease and their family members. Dr. Moak is also past president of the American Association of Geriatric Psychiatry. And it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Gary Moak. How about now? All right, great. Uh, uh, thanks for that introduction, Laura. And uh, I also want to welcome everybody and express my appreciation that so many people are interested in this important and timely topic, Alzheimer's disease. In, in this, uh, in thinking about what to start this year's program with, our Be, Mental, Be, Be Mentally Well series, um, Alzheimer's seemed natural because of what we perceive to be uh, rapidly growing public interest in the field and uh, an even rapidly, uh, more rapidly growing interest in knowing about it and uh, its management. Um, so I'm going to spend a few minutes putting this evening's program in a broader context for you before we get into Dr. Brown's presentation. Um, Alzheimer's uh, is, has become a household word and uh, everybody, uh, most people have been touched by it in one way or another. Let, let's actually stop and take a quick survey. How many people here are here related to interest having to do with their work professionally or with, with Alzheimer patients and their families? And how many are here due to a personal interest because they know somebody with Alzheimer's disease? Okay, and if you folks how many of you are actually caregivers or have been caregivers? Okay, terrific. Um, I won't ask those of you who are here because you have Alzheimer's disease to raise your hands. Um, actually, this is uh, no real, this is no laughing matter. Um, uh, pretty serious stuff. Oops. Um, we now think there are over 5 million Americans with Alzheimer's disease. And what this graph shows, this comes from the Alzheimer's Association. The numbers are mounting rapidly, and it's estimated that by the middle part of the 21st century, there'll be somewhere between 12 and 16 million Americans with Alzheimer's disease, uh, maybe more depending on what happens. Now, that's actually a scary enough statistic, but um, the bigger, the thing that's even more scary is this number, that by 2050, 115 million Americans will have been affected by the disorder. And more importantly, it's not just these 115 million people who have been affected by, but as this slide suggests, it's family members, caregivers, and other people who are impacted by this disorder. Alzheimer's is often referred to as a memory disorder. It's, it's thought of as a brain disease, which it certainly is. Um, but we think of it uh, more than that. We think of it as a family disorder because this illness impacts uh, almost everybody in the family that has any any connection to the person affected. And the impact this will take on all the folks related to these 115 million Americans by this point is going to be staggering. Um, 
Alzheimer's is a chronic disorder, so clinically, it's common to break it down into mild, moderate, and severe stages. And if you do the math, you could see that the moderate stage can last up to 10 years. The mild stage, which people often go through preclinically, meaning they have it, but the diagnosis isn't made there. They have Alzheimer's disease. It might be apparent with uh, new diagnostic technologies that we have now. Or, or, or to clinicians in Alzheimer's clinical evaluation centers who are trained to pick the diagnosis up. But in this stage, it often goes unrecognized. And sadly, even in the moderate stage, it often goes undiagnosed and untreated. But increasingly, while, while the textbooks say that um, uh, people live about eight years from the time the diagnosis is made, those of us who do this work and see many patients with Alzheimer's disease see many people who have lived far longer than that, 8, 10, 12 years. I have some that are that long live with Alzheimer's in my practice. And so the impact for them over that period of time, as well as their families, is just staggering. Um, people think of Alzheimer's as a memory disorder. And in fact, what's important to understand is that's the least important aspect of this disorder clinically. This slide is put up, and, and you're going to see more about brain pathology. You're going to hear more about brain pathology in Dr. Brown's talk. But this slide is put up just to emphasize that Alzheimer's disease is a, is a disease of slow, progressive brain deterioration and, and, and withering and brain cell death, ultimately leading to this very, very ugly-looking, shrunken brain. And the importance, the, the point of this slide is to point out that Alzheimer's disease affects the whole brain. It's not just a disorder of memory. It affects everything the brain does, everything that makes all of us human beings. And so the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease have to do with the failure of the brain to do all the things that are normal for people to do day by day. And, and it's, often, um, it's often families and other caregivers often don't understand why is somebody behaving this way? They seem to be able to remember things well enough to not behave this way. And it's important to understand that it's not just the memory that it's affected. It's all aspects of human behavior. Now, just to, just to bring the point home even further, this is a, this is a slide showing a new, a new imaging technology that actually is available clinically, and we do use this clinically sometime, called PET scanning. Um, this is a type of brain imaging that shows brain metabolic activity as opposed to the brain structure. So it tells us how active the brain is. Oops. And in a normal brain, um, normal brain activity is seen by these areas. The colors are often in this projection. But in these nice hot orange and red and yellow areas, those hot areas represent normal brain activity. And you could see as the brain deteriorates over time and starts to look like that one in the last slide I showed you, it cools off. The darker colors, purple, blue, represent areas where brain activity is not what it should be. So I just want you to imagine that people with moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease are trying to function day to day with brains that work like this. And this really accounts for why such all the range of disabling symptoms that we see. This slide comes from the, the National Alzheimer's Association and looks at why um, the federal government has now gotten much more active in this area and has been in the news recently. And some of you may be aware of the National Alzheimer's Plan Act and the draft national plan that's just been posted on, on, on the internet. But what this tries to show is the projected total cost increase in, in Alzheimer's disease and shows that around, right around now, Costs are running our society um, about $200 billion a year. But projected forward to the middle part of the century, it's projected that Alzheimer's disease will cost society up to $1 trillion a year. It's, it's a trillion dollars, a staggering amount of money. Um, and because of that, if, you, if you're aware of where our healthcare system already is and the mess it's already in, we, we can't possibly um, even fathom how we're going to begin to, to take care of all these patients. So we have to think about doing things differently. And that's why um, in 2011, Congress passed and President Obama signed into law the National Alzheimer's uh, Project Act, um, which required the administration to put together a national action plan, which has, which has been drafted and posted on the internet. And you can review it. And actually, um, the, the notice and comment period to the public is now open. So you can review this plan on the internet. And then, oops, sorry, if you, um, you can actually submit comments. 
uh, if you like. And this, this can be comments from organizations, from professionals, or from individuals. And those comments are, are, are being welcomed by the government and, and are being reviewed. Uh, don't bother to try to copy this down. If you simply Google search National Alzheimer's Project Act and then click on plan, you'll get there. Um, it's about a 10-page document, pretty easy to read. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, this plan has, has several important goals that I just want to highlight for you by way of concluding here. One is that it set out a very ambitious, aspirational goal of trying to find a cure by the year 2025. Now, that's a good goal. Whether we're likely to get there or not is a question. But um, in order to accomplish that, the plan calls for a 25% increase in research funding. And this year alone, the, uh, the government allocated $50 million more to Alzheimer's disease research. Uh, so, so things are beginning to happen. The second thing it does, which is, which is even more important for those of you doing this work day to day and those of you who are caregivers, is it changes the focus a little bit from what has been on purely cure, find the cure, to how do we figure out how to do a better job taking care of these patients and helping their families manage this disabling condition. So it, it's really focused more on preparation for the tsunami of Alzheimer patients that we're going to see and the cost of their care. And that includes, under that, better treatment services so that people will be able to turn, to know they can get the kind of health care services that they need that will make a difference, more family support. And, and for, that involves first figuring out what are the more effective ways that we can help families um, manage this illness, deal with its impact, if you will. And then increasingly, more public awareness, more education and engagement of the public. Uh, which gets us gets me to conclude with an overview of tonight's program. So we thought, in, in terms of trying to address this topic, we thought we would um, organize our talks to try to respond to concerns and questions commonly raised by people working with, with Alzheimer patients, family members, caregivers, and, and uh, caregivers in, in uh, uh, healthcare organizations. So it's divided into three commonly um, posed questions. One is commonly, will I get it when I'm older? So mom has it or dad has it, and, and three or four of the children come in, and uh, they know that grandma had it, and Uncle Phil had it, and Aunt Sally had it, so am I going to get it? And uh, is there genetic testing that I should have? And so we're going to, uh, in the next talk given by Dr. Brown, um, uh, provide information about genetic risks and some of the scientific background uh, behind uh, genetics and the genetic testing, and then hopefully some advice about how people should think about this. The next question is, so there are treatments out there. The treatments aren't real good, but there are treatments. And uh, common questions are, first, what can be done to treat it? But with people that are on treatment, what's the value of these treatments? Do they do any good? Should we, should we, mom's been on, on Aricept for five years. Should, is it still working? Should we keep her on it? So our next talk will then um, look at information about what treatments do and what their real, their real value is. What do they really do for people and what difference do they make? And then finally, uh, getting back to this topic of what can be done to help family members, caregivers manage the impact of this a bit better. Common question we get is, uh, where do we turn for help? So diagnosis has been made, medicine's been started, but where do we get some help managing this? Uh, where can we turn? And we'll, be un we'll, we'll have our third talk, we'll focus on understanding the value of, of caregiver intervention specifically in mitigating some of the bad outcomes associated with this disease. So um, I'm going to turn up the mic over to um, Laura, who introduced Dr. Brown, our first speaker. Thank you. Dr. Brown. Um, as Dr. Zadonis mentioned before, is the chair of the Department of Neurology here at UMass Medical School. Prior to coming to UMass, he was a professor of neurology for 30 years at Harvard Medical School and the Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Brown earned an undergraduate degree in biophysics at Amherst College, a doctorate degree in neurophysiology at Oxford University, and his MD at Harvard Medical School. Throughout his career, he has had a long-standing interest in neurodegenerative and neuromuscular diseases. 
His research activities have been devoted to identifying and trying to treat gene defects that cause Lou Gehrig's disease and some types of muscular dystrophy. He is a member of the Institute of Medicine, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Brown. Let's see, I want to be able to call up my PowerPoint, please. Actually, that would do it. I can then get it from the menu at the bottom. Yeah, I just want to... Thank you. Great. This is working, I guess. That's it. Yeah, good. Okay, I'm going to... Thank you. I, uh, again, want to uh, thank the organizers for the chance to participate in this meeting. It's really a, a great pleasure. Um, I am a neurologist, as you've heard. I've spent most of the last 30 years trying to understand what it means uh, when a disease that causes degeneration of the brain begins, how these diseases unfold, and ultimately how we can treat them. Um, my own focus has been on Lou Gehrig's disease, but of course, in thinking about this general category of diseases, uh, one inevitably uh, is drawn to thinking about this devastating disorder, Alzheimer's disease. And I've been asked to say a few words about um, how we begin to think about the genetics of this disease, and I'm happy to do so. I think this is an important topic um, in the context of tonight, primarily because it has direct implication for how we begin to think about handling this in a family or in uh, the context of colleagues with this disease. But I would point out from the standpoint of research that we also think this is very important because if we can understand the genes that can cause a disease, in which the brain degenerates, we can begin through the genes to think about pathways whereby molecular events or dominoes fall that lead to the disease. And of course, that in turn, hopefully, identifies targets for treatment. So these things all can come together uh, built on thinking about genetics. Um, so what, what I'd like to do is just say a couple of general words about the neurodegenerative disorders uh, in general, because that is what Alzheimer's disease is. This is a set of disorders in which the brain or parts of the nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, slowly start to deteriorate, almost as if one slowly turns down the rheostat in the cell and eventually then sees death of cells. And these are disorders that tend to start in one part of the brain and then slowly spread. So I would submit that even if we can't figure out what triggers the cause, if we could understand why they spread, that too would be very, very beneficial. So listed here are um, disorders which we've all uh, probably heard of. Of course, Alzheimer's disease is at the top of the list. There's another type of uh, disease that affects thinking in the brain called frontotemporal dementia. I'll say a couple of words about that. But the other big ones that we do hear about are things like Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, of course, ALS. And guess what? The most common neurodegenerative disease in our society is macular degeneration. There are millions and millions of people who have that. That is a neurodegenerative disease much like Alzheimer's disease. And so it shares many of the features of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so just to, to, to also emphasize the point, there are a set of disorders <coughs> which we do not usually think of <coughs> excuse me, as neurodegenerative in which there can be deterioration of nerve cells after an injury over time. And these include strokes, uh, head trauma. <coughs> We've read a lot lately about how, for example, football players who have a lot of head trauma can develop behavioral problems, and even Lou Gehrig's disease several years down the line. We know that multiple sclerosis, which we usually were taught was an inflammatory disease, can actually trigger slow degeneration of the long processes from nerve cells called axons. So that, too, has a neurodegenerative component, as do many other metabolic diseases, such as diabetes. So this really is a very broad category of diseases. Um, and although I would love to spend about four hours showing you a, a huge pile of PowerPoints, that describe all the molecular biology that we think we know about this disease, I'll boil it down to one two-minute summary, which is shown here. And that is that in, in virtually all of those diseases, to the extent that we understand them, when a nerve cell die, uh, dies, it, it essentially experiences a set of events inside the cell and outside the cell, which in one way or another participate in the death process. So for example, uh, when a nerve cell in uh, Alzheimer's disease or ALS dies, we know that there are processes whereby Proteins in the cell get misfolded and form clumps or aggregates. We know that the firing pattern, these are electrical cells, they burst. That's how they talk to one another. That's what thinking is. We know that the firing patterns of these cells sometimes are dramatically enhanced and that too much firing is very bad for a cell. It causes rundown of the batteries and rundown of energy. 
And we know that the parts of the cells that make energy to sustain the electrical activity and the long processes that allow nerve cells to talk to each other, the mitochondria get sick and that energy generation is not normal. And the result is that the whole cellular machinery is under metabolic and molecular stress. But as if that isn't bad enough, we also know that when a nerve cell starts to undergo these processes internally, it activates surrounding cells, which aren't necessarily even nerve cells, to become involved. So for example, there are supporting cells. They're called blue cells or glia. They proliferate. They, they, they divide like crazy. And, and there's actually then inflammation around the dying cell. So as if it's not bad enough that the cell itself is sick, now there's inflammation around the cell, which makes the whole process accelerate and become more exaggerated. And again, if we could understand which of these components is most important and treat it, this would each be potentially a way to treating this disease. So there are intrinsic problems and extrinsic problems. Um, so this is one way, um, which is almost like a cliche that we think of these diseases, and that is that they reflect an interplay between um, a variety of factors. One's genetic makeup or genotype. Um, something about one's behavior is one exposed to uh, sporting events with a lot of head trauma, for example. The environment, yeah, are there poisons in the environment like lead or, or, or perhaps toxins of other sorts? Or is there bad luck? And, and there's some interplay between these factors is what finally sets the stage for this disease and tips a sick cell over to actually go on and develop one of these degenerative disorders. And this is just to make the point that the, as far as we can tell, the genetic factors that play in each of these diseases vary a bit. So for example, we've all heard about Woody Guthrie's disease, Huntington's disease. We know that almost always, almost 100% of the time, that disease occurs because exclusively of genetic factors. A very bad gene gets inherited that triggers this kind of process. We know that in Lou Gehrig's disease, that kind of uh, potently acting gene is seen in only about 10% of cases. In Parkinson's, it's about 5%. And in fact, when you look for families where there's a very strong family history of Alzheimer's disease, they tend to be relatively uncommon, 1, 2, or 3%. Now, that's not to say that there aren't minor genetic factors that contribute to the disease process. But what I'm trying to say is that the role of genetic factors varies quite considerably from disease to disease. The other point I would make quickly is that when genetics have defined pathways and proteins, that can trigger this process in a family with a disease, it turns out that in the non-familial cases of the disease, the same gene and the same proteins turn out to be important. So again, that's kind of like an argument for saying we can use the keyhole of genetics to learn about how these diseases occur, and the lessons seem to apply across the board to all of the types of families and all of the types of cases. So this is true for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, in which a protein called beta amyloid and another called alpha synuclein have been implicated. So what I've summarized here, and I suspect probably everyone has seen this kind of table before, is a list of some of the genes that we know are clearly implicated in either early onset or late onset Alzheimer's disease. And, and again, uh, probably the best study is the one at the top of the list, this protein called beta amyloid. Um, and two others which have been more recently identified are so-called presenilin 1, presenilin 2. Um, and it seems pretty clear that mutations in these genes can actually cause the disease. So we think of them as causative. They can actually trigger the disease. But what's also interesting is that all of us, as we know, throughout our complement of genes have a lot of variations which are normal variations that don't necessarily cause disease, but which nonetheless are present as part of our being humans in a, in a mixed population. And it turns out that some of these in combination, uh, or even one by one, can increase risk of a disease if, even if they don't actually cause a disease, okay? So there's one such variation in a gene that makes a protein called apolipoprotein E, which also is a risk factor for setting the stage for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So, so, so this is a, a working list of four entities that we know are implicated in varying degrees of severity and, uh, and, and varying degrees of impact in Alzheimer's disease. We know, by the way, as it happens, that individuals with Down syndrome uh, and individuals that have duplications of the gene that make this protein beta amyloid also are at high risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. So I'll come back to this. Uh, but this, th this, this is, if you will, a short template of what we know about the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. I will also tell you that there have been some extraordinary studies looking at thousands and thousands of cases 
as compared to thousands of controls, looking for those subtle, normally occurring variations to ask, do any of them set the stage for or increase the risk for Alzheimer's disease? And there are now probably 15 more um, genetic factors that play a role, but I'm not going to go over those. Uh, but they clearly, they clearly are part of the emerging story. Um, so, so this is, as Dr. Moak said, just a, a, another view of uh, what we see uh, pathologically in the disease. It, I, I suspect that the clinical nature of this disease is well known to everyone here. Um, what we are taught clinically, and I think as a general rule, is that one of the earliest manifestations of this disease is impairment of memory. Um, we all experience a lot of that just as part of normal aging, of course, but in a very exaggerated in malignant form, that's often the earliest sign of Alzheimer's disease. And what's rather striking from the standpoint of human behavior is that people who have significant memory loss are often otherwise um, very much intact, and they can have a, a normal conversation and drive a car and even conduct business, and it's only when one pushes hard that one realizes there's a real problem with memory as opposed to behavior. Um, so that's, that, that's usually the earliest sign of the disease, and, and, and then, of course, it, it spreads rather widely to involve many, many functions, including uh, cognition in general, and then behavior. Um, and, and so what one sees is that uh, in late stage disease, after uh, many years of the process, um, the whole brain looks uh, atrophied or thinned or wasted. So this is a normal brain on the left. Uh, Dr. Mocha pointed a similar picture out. This is a, a, a relatively late stage, stage Alzheimer's disease. And what one can see is that these folds uh, of, of uh, the top of the brain are all greatly uh, smaller in the affected than in the unaffected brain with a lot more space in between them. And exactly as you saw before, in fact, I think this is the same image. If, if you cut each of these uh, in half and then look at it end on, what you see is this dramatic uh, distinction uh, between the appearance of the middle part and the cortex of the brain in a normal as compared to an Alzheimer's case. Um, and a bit like the PET scan that you saw, if one does an MRI scan uh, through uh, these brains, one sees uh, in the normal brain, a typical distribution of gray and white matter and um, spinal and cerebrospinal fluid in the middle with great distortion of that anatomy in Alzheimer's disease. So that these so-called ventricles, these pools of uh, cerebrospinal fluid are greatly increased because the brain itself has wasted or atrophy. And if you then look under a microscope, you see a couple of really striking features. And I, I won't spend a whole lot of time on these. But here at the top, for example, is a, a relatively normal microscopic snapshot of a human brain. And so you see a field of pink, and then you see these black dots. And those black dots are the nuclei of all the cells, nerve cells, non-nerve cells. And there's a kind of even scattering of these and a homogeneity of the pinkness, which is very normal. But if you look in an um, Alzheimer's brain, you see with the right kinds of stains, uh, basically these large splotches of brown, and those are uh, so-called senile plaques. So those represent areas in between neurons where there has been deposited uh, large amounts of uh, this beta amyloid uh, protein and indeed many other proteins. These are distinctly abnormal, and in fact, as the uh, burden of these increases, the severity of the disease increases. So this is, if you will, a microscopic marker for the disease. There's another marker. These are spots in between neurons, but if you actually look inside neurons, you see something else. And that is you see evidence that one of the major sort of railroad tracks along which a, a neuron uh, runs itself um, internally uh, is abnormal. And that, and, and that, that is uh, basically as shown here. Uh, the protein that's disturbed is called tau, and indeed there are others with it, uh, which gets deposited into clumps inside the cell that cause these so-called tangles. And so taken together, these plaques and these tangles are the signature of, of this disease. And if you look at a higher magnification, uh, this is a typical plaque. And this is one of these tangles that involves these railroad tracks or filaments. So these are called neurofibrillary uh, tangles. And I won't belabor the molecular biology, but I will just show you one quick image, which is here. So this is um, the precursor of beta amyloid protein which I've depicted, it's depicted here as a, as, a, as a colored symbol. Normally, in all of us, this gets uh, cleaved or broken down in several steps into two uh, end products here, which generally are not at all toxic. Uh, they have a certain size uh, that is easily handled by the body, and, and in general, they don't cause any problem. However, in uh, Alzheimer's disease, it is thought that the way these are broken down becomes abnormal, so that one of the particles becomes a little bit too large. They, the, the unit of weight is a kilodalton, it doesn't matter, but normally it's 38 to 40. And in uh, the pathologic setting, it becomes slightly heavier, 
And the balance is such that when this heavier form uh, is too abundant, these proteins begin to clump together into structures called oligomers, which contribute to the formation of these senile plaques, and then ultimately lead to brain death. So as one focuses in the whole brain, and then part of the brain, and then a cell, and then inside a cell, the smallest event that one can describe, which is clearly part of this, has to do with one single molecule, which is abnormally cut and metabolized. Um, and so one, one, one pathway view of this would be something like this, that um, this is a disease in which something triggers an initial problem, either a gene mutation and the mutations uh, I've mentioned, or something else, a blow to the head or perhaps uh, some environmental toxin that leads then to the problems that I've just shown you with the amyloid protein, the formation of plaques, and then probably secondarily to that, alteration of the uh, intracellular proteins leading to the formation of these tangles and ultimately to nerve cell death and significant atrophy. Now, I'm just going to digress for a minute to say that uh, that's a, a, a sort of a high altitude view of Alzheimer's disease, but I want to just for two minutes mention that there are other kinds of fairly common uh, um, uh, dementing diseases in society. And one of the first challenges when one sees uh, these cases is to make sure that one knows exactly which type of case one is dealing with. But just very, very briefly, I've mentioned that in Alzheimer's disease, disease the, the, the first element almost always clinically is sort of an insidious failure of memory. Well, in this uh, other, um, less common but not rare uh, form of a brain disease called frontotemporal dementia, the hallmark is not memory, but it's change in behavior. So in these individuals, memory is just fine, but they lose what you might call executive skills. They become impulsive, they uh, show poor judgment, um, and they sometimes have problems with speech, and only later does memory get involved. Um, so, 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 so in fact, it is thought that uh, someone as great as uh, Friedrich uh, Nietzsche had this, um, th this, this impulsivity is a so-called frontal syndrome. Um, we can go into the details later, but there are one or two very uh, carefully studied cases of frontal syndrome epitomized by a man called Phineas Gage. I can come back to this later. Um, but the point about this is this is a different clinical picture in a slightly different type of picture in pathology. So here we have a comparison, again, of normal and Alzheimer's brains. In this disease, one sees not diffuse brain atrophy, but very focal atrophy at least initially, over the front part of the brain, which is the frontal pole, and over this part, which is the temporal region. So this is not only a different clinical picture, but it's a different pathologic flavor. Uh, and as, as one looks, uh, again, at MRI scans, this is normal, this is Alzheimer's. You see diffuse wasting in Alzheimer's disease, but here, the back part of the brain looks pretty good. It's the front part that shows the disease. So, so this is just to share with you a different, uh, as it were, signature of a different type of, of process that can affect thinking. Uh, and just I'll tell you briefly that the pathology, when you look under the microscope, is rather different. You don't see plaques and tangles in this disease. Instead, you see deposits of several other proteins, sometimes with a few tangles. Um, and I, 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 we can talk about this in more detail, but in this particular type of uh, dementing process, there have now been some five or six gene defects that have been defined. So as we think about the broader question for tonight, which is how does one use genetics to help diagnose, understand, and ultimately treat this disease, we have to be mindful that there are different types of brain disorders, different type, uh, types of dementia, and they actually drive different types of diagnostic workups. Um, and so, so just to finalize this point about frontotemporal dementia, here uh, we think that somehow the trigger, the ultimate uh, up, upstream insult, leads to the tangles and protein pathology without the formation of plaques. So um, what, what about how we approach this from a clinical genetic testing standpoint. Well, I thought I'd just share a couple of points now, and then uh, during a discussion, we can perhaps go through these things in more detail. But I will tell you that a lot of thought over the last uh, 15 years or so has gone into the question of how do you handle genetic testing in one of these devastating brain diseases? So, so, so many of the issues are, are, are those that are sort of obvious. Um, one question is, what does it mean to have a positive test? What does it mean to have a negative test? What does either type of information do to the person being evaluated? You know, there is the, the, the issue of, of course, devastating uh, despondency if one is found to have one of these terrible genetic lesions. Um, but believe it or not, there are well-documented instances, a whole phenomenon of people who are shown not to have a lesion, but who then go into despondency and severe uh, depression because of so-called survivor guilt phenomenology. So the whole question of how one uses, understands, and reacts to this information has to be thought about very carefully as one thinks about the question of genetic testing 
I defer very much to my uh, wonderful colleagues in psychiatry who deal with this sort of thing all the time. I will tell you that in Huntington's disease, wherein the first gene defect of all of these was defined in 1993, there has been a lot of thought and a, a lot of generation of good guidelines for knowing how to handle these questions. And, and, and this is something that's readily available. Um, the American uh, College of uh, Medical Genetics has put together just quite recently, um, I think this is actually 2011, last summer, a new set of guidelines for how to handle genetic counseling. And they have focused on Alzheimer's disease. Um, I will tell you that the Alzheimer's Society and other groups have also put together similar guidelines. And so I've summarized two or three or five or seven or eight or whatever points here that I think are, are, are some of the major uh, points that we might want to come back to later as we think about genetic testing and Alzheimer's disease. And, and I think um, the first thing uh, to say is that the most common variant that can predispose to Alzheimer's disease is this one I mentioned, apolipoprotein E. And one particular variant of it called E4 is the culprit that really sets the stage for Alzheimer's disease. But the critical point is that to have that variant is not necessarily to get the disease. And, and, and in fact, that's, that, that's a crucial point because again, it's a risk factor, it sets the stage, but it doesn't necessarily cause the disease. And then several other points that I'm sure you've thought about which are probably worth emphasizing, and that is that if one turns out to have either this variant or uh, the mutations in the other genes I've mentioned that can cause Alzheimer's disease, it's very important to remember that these cannot be used, nor should they in any way be used, uh, for example, to de deny uh, any kind of access to social services, be it housing, employment, health care, insurance, or anything else. Um, and uh, the, the other point to make is that to have the gene, because it doesn't necessarily mean that one will have the disease, is not to guarantee access to disability or uh, uh, insurance or to uh, uh, services, uh, which in fact should or should not be uh, granted depending on a functional criteria rather than genetic criteria. Um, one of the things that we think is very, very important as we see people clinically is, is preserving anonymity. Okay, so so uh, obviously, as you know, you own your medical records. You have a right to see everything in any record in any medical center, um, but you own it and no one else owns it and no one else has access to it. And we think it's very important when dealing with genetic information that might portend a dire uh, disease like Huntington's disease or, or ALS or, or AD to guarantee that an, that kind of anonymity uh, be preserved. Um, one of the things that we, we think uh, is, is critically important is that uh, counseling be invoked both before and after uh, the test is done for the kinds of reasons I've already tried to summarize to you. Um, and then uh, another point which I know Dr. Moak will talk probably a lot about uh, in the next few minutes, is the fact that um, despite intense work and a lot of progress, and I think real progress in terms of understanding the genetic makeup of this disease, we really don't have good therapies. We have some issues about lifestyle choice. We have some ideas. There's a one or, there are one or two medications that slow the disease a bit, but we don't have really good therapies. And that, that has to be remembered when one talks about the implications of genetic testing. And then, and, and, then, and then two other very sort of obvious points. Uh, all the societies that prepare these guidelines I feel it's not useful to do this testing in children. Uh, we could come back to that. And the other point I would make is that it's astonishing when you go online and Google genetic testing. There are a lot of places out there that will take your money to test your DNA for a whole bunch of things. You know, you can pay 100 bucks and give them a cheek squab, and you can get uh, statements about the genetic risk in you of getting cancer, heart disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease or other things. And what I, what I want to say is that, in our view, that's the absolutely worst way to think about the question of genetic testing. Um, in part because one doesn't know about the accuracy of what they do, but much more importantly, uh, that's a service that's provided without any of the counseling that really should be performed uh, in, in which to set the context for understanding the data from the DNA tests. Um, so those are, those are my comments, and I guess uh, the idea is that later we'll have a, a time for discussion. Thank you.
How's, uh, how's that? You can you hear me in the back? Terrific. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and uh, spend a little bit of time focusing on treatment. And um, as Dr. Brown said, unfortunately, in 2012, uh, we don't have great treatments for Alzheimer's disease. That's a, a sad reality. But we do have treatments, uh, medical treatments and um, family and psychological treatments and behavioral treatments that can make a difference. And what I want to do is spend a little bit of time talking with you about treatment with medicine and think about what helpful impact it can make to individual patients and their families, and how you understand what's valuable in terms of results of treatment. There currently are four medicines available on the market in the U.S. for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Many, some of these medicines are used widely to treat other sources of dementia off-label, meaning they're not approved uses by the FDA, but some evidence shows that they may be helpful in other dementias, and it's accepted clinical practice for these medicines to be used especially because there's often a lot of overlap. Many people that have other kinds of dementia, like vascular dementia, also have concurrent Alzheimer's disease. But there's some evidence that these drugs may help, may help vascular dementia as well. So one issue is understanding di the diagnosis and what implications that has about whether these kinds of medicines can or can't be used. Many of you may be familiar with one or more of these medicines. The four medicines, and I'll list them by um, brand name, which is the way most people are, know them, Aricept, Razodyne, Exelon, and Namenda, represent essentially two different families of drugs. Um, the cholinesterase inhibitor medicines, Aricept, Razodyne, and Exelon, and then uh, something with an odd name, an NMDA receptor uh, antagonist called Namenda, works differently. And these things, these things treat Alzheimer's disease in two different ways. And so using a medicine from one family along with a medicine from another family is not a redundancy or an overlap. It's a, it's a kind of one-two punch. It's a synergistic approach that in many cases we consider to be the standard of, of care at this point. Um, you may be aware that Aricept is now available as generic medicine called Donepazil. That's a tremendous source of confusion for many people right now because that just happened this year. Uh, and Razodyne has been available as generic uh, galantamine for some time. Those of you who know somebody who's a veteran and gets benefits through the VA, um, that's been their preferred cholinesterase inhibitor for some time. And Exelon is available as a skin patch. That's, that you may, anyone who watches TV these days has seen the commercials for that. The sad state of Alzheimer's disease care in the 21st century is, uh, is that treatment, we're in a sad state still. Um, despite the fact that Aricept has been available since 1997, which already now seems like a long time ago to me, uh, and other medicines came out shortly thereafter. So we've had these treatments, they've been around for a while. Uh, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is still delayed way too long. Patients are, are me often years and sometimes many years into the disease before clear diagnosis is made. Uh, and treatment is often not started early enough. It's often started very late in the disease if it started at all. And what's startling to me is to have people come to my office who already have severe Alzheimer's disease and they've never been treated. That's really uh, a shame. Um, that we hope to, to correct by, by greater public awareness, primarily. Um, as Dr. Brown said, the current available treatments are not great. These are not wonderful drugs. Frankly, they stink. They're, they're very disappointing. They don't work great. They're not curative. They don't, they don't arrest the progression of disease. So they, don't, they don't put off the inevitable. Uh, and on average, on average, they're not all that helpful. And this is one of the sources of confusion, is that if you look at the clinical studies that are done, that led to the approval of these medicines, they look at, at aggregate outcomes using, using broad outcome measures of cognitive ability, functional ability, and behavior, and that show that these medicines compared to placebos provide some benefit, but on average, the benefit is not, is not too great. The problem is that in clinical practice, we don't practice this way. We work with one patient and one family at a time and we use the medicines as part of a comprehensive treatment plan done by a team of professionals looking at what's important to that patient and their family, what, make, what will make a difference to them in their lives. 
we often can achieve better results, but it, it requires a lot of expertise and a lot of effort. And that often gets lost in studies where you, you have a one-size-fits-all approach to measuring re results of treatment. And then, of course, like all medicines, these, these drugs are limited by their side effects. Fortunately, the side effects are not great, but these drugs do have side effects. Now, because the data have not been robust and because we're in an era of great cost consciousness and questions about the effectiveness of interventions and what's really valuable to do and what's not, uh, there's been a lot of confusion uh, about the use of these medicines. One has been that the results are so, are so marginal that maybe they don't really work at all. And, and we get this from, we, we see this kind of feedback from patients, from their family members, from their healthcare providers, and sometimes even their physicians. We started somebody on a medicine, didn't do anything, clearly wasn't helpful, so we stopped it. Uh, medicine didn't work. Or they don't really work well enough, uh, as I mentioned before. Or they don't alter the inevitable, which is true. They don't stop the inexorable progression of the disease. And that's led to a lot of skepticism and nihilism among, among many people, including primary care doctors, that treatment just isn't worth, worth initiating. It just doesn't make a difference in the long run. What's really important in terms of managing the impact of Alzheimer's disease is mitigating the effects over the course of the illness to try to preserve what quality of life is possible for patients and their families. So the goal is not so much to change the inevitable. The goal, as Dr. Brown pointed out, is to see if we can slow that down and preserve function and well-being as long as possible to maintain a higher quality of life. And then there's this idea that these drugs only work for about one year, and then they wear off, and um, they're no longer really necessary at that point. And so a common problem is that patients are put on medicine, they're treated for a year, and then the medicine is stopped because it, it's believed it's really not, not doing, uh, doing much anymore. So unfortunately, the sad state of things at this point is that, on, is that uh, half of all patients on Aricep or other cholinesterase inhibitors stop treatment after one year. And generally, that's because of their perceived lack of benefit. Sometimes it has to do with concerns about side effects, but most of the time it has to do with a belief that the medicines just aren't doing anything anymore. Now, now where does this, this belief come from? So I'm going to spend a few minutes looking at some data, which I don't hope, I hope not to spend too much time on this. But what I want to show you here is this is a graph that shows a typical, typical data from a clinical trial with one of the cholinesterase inhibitor medicines. It applies pretty well to what you see with Namenda as well. What it depicts here is at the beginning when treatment is started, so the patient, this green line depicts the results of treatment with medicine, the patients who get uh, the active treatment. And what it shows, this is along this line, is how they do on a, on a, a cognitive rating scale, memory, language ability, other, other mental abilities. And what you see is that with treatment starts, they initially get a little bit better, and they stay improved for a while, after which they slowly begin to lose a little ground and then by, by a year, they end up right back where they started from. And this has led to this misconception that these drugs only work for about a year, after which they wear off. Now, what's really important to understand about this is to, is to look at what happens to the people that, that are represented by this blue line. Now, the blue line are people who start out with the same level of Alzheimer's disease and are given placebos. And what you see what happens with them is they stay about the same for a little bit and then they begin to lose ground. And then um, this line projects where they would be a year later if we continue to follow them. But for ethical reasons, these, that, that isn't done. These patients are then given the treatment. And the fact that they're given the treatment should tell you something. It means that people believe these drugs are of value because they don't think it's ethical to continue not treating these patients because they're declining. And the point of the slide is that while these folks who got the treatment a year later are no better off than they were when they started out. During that year, they were a little bit better. But more importantly, compared to where they would have been had they not gotten treatment, they're, they're ahead of the game. They're ahead of where they would have been. And um, I'm going to show you a slide later that, that projects what happens five years out, that, which really it becomes a huge, shows the impact that it can, just can make for patients and their families. Um, and then the other part of the slide is that so these people that got placebos and then were given treatment, you see that they, they do get better later on um, and they improve just like the original group did, 
but they never quite catch up to the first group. They get better, but they never catch up. So they, they have lost a little, a little ground just by waiting. Uh, now, let's, let's talk a little bit about what it means for, as disease progresses, because what we're talking about mitigating the impact for patients and their families, we really have to think about what are the broad range of, 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 of problems that Alzheimer's disease causes, what are the sources of, of dis distress, disability, burden, and cost. And we know that as the disease slowly, inexorably gets worse, psychiatric and behavioral symptoms rapidly escalate. So psychiatric complications of Alzheimer's disease are common throughout the disease, but these become more, more prevalent, more frequent as the disease gets, gets worse, and they become more severe and harder to manage. It's important to keep in mind, if you look at the burden of care and the things that lead people to, to need to go into long-term care, nursing homes in particular, the leading cause of, of, of burden and long-term care placement are behavioral symptoms. It's real important to understand that. And, and that's the leading cause of, of, of burden and distress for family members and depression in caregivers. So this is a focus where we can really make a difference. Um, Caregiver burden increases as the disease gets worse. And more importantly, the costs of the disease escalate rapidly. So for every point on, on a test like the mini mental state, which mo many people are familiar with, the standard commonly used rating scale of, of disease severity, for every point it gets worse, we can predict the increase in caregiver burden and the increase in cost how many more visits to the primary care physician there'll be, how many more physicians to the emergency room, how many more hospitalizations, how many more um, medicines the caregivers will take, and the like. This, this slide um, is a theoretical slide that tries to get at the benefit of early versus later treatment. So again, these treatments don't cure anything. What, what's the value of giving them? So in a neurodegenerative disorder, disorder uh, any of the kind that Dr. Brown described, where things are, are slowly, inevitably going to get worse until the point where somebody dies. Um, we have treatments, the treatments we have can make a small difference, as I showed you on the previous slide. And this shows really the, the, diff, the, the, the impact of earlier treatment, diagnosing the condition earlier and treating it earlier on, versus waiting and waiting and waiting and diagnosing and treating it later. So treating it later, makes a difference. It, it brings about some improvement in the course of the disease, and that, that benefit to patients and their families is this difference in here. But you could see if we treated it earlier, that difference might not only be greater along the way, but in terms of the time to when certain results occur. Not only, not only death, which isn't really what many people consider the most important concern at this point, but things like when do you have to go into a nursing home? When, when can you no longer drive? When can you no longer stay home alone? When do you stop recognizing your family? When can you no longer dress yourself or feed yourself or use the bathroom independently? This difference can really be a huge difference. This is the impact with, uh, made by an early treatment that doesn't work great versus, <laughs> versus delaying the treatment or no treatment at all. Um, and, and you can see it, it can make a huge difference for individuals and their families. How do we know these, these medicines actually work? Well, there's the data I showed you. Um, there's also our clinical experience. In, in working with individuals, one patient at a time, we start patients on treatment, and lo and behold, sometimes they get better. But more importantly, and our experience can be biased by that. So there's placebo effect, there's the effect of expectation, all the other things that we do to help patients and their families cope make a difference. So they may improve for a lot of reasons that may not have to do with the medicine. But we see people that have been on medicine for a while and then get taken off for one reason or another. It's startling how often, um, within the weeks or months after that, they very rapidly decline. That the skills that they had and functions they had rapidly disappear. And when the medicine is resumed, those, those functions often come back pretty quickly. Um, that happens so many times that it, it, it's, it's hard not to be impressed by it when you see it enough. Um, plus, we also have data. Now, I apologize for this sort of confusing scientific slide, but I put this up for two reasons. First is that this, this is a slide that comes from a paper that was just published this month. So this is hot off the press data, 
published in the New England Journal of Medicine earlier this month that looks at, for the first time, what happens in people with severe Alzheimer's disease who are receiving Aricep. What happens if you stop the treatment at that stage? So it addresses this question, are these drugs really doing any good? Uh, you know, mom has now got severe Alzheimer's. She's been on Aricep for four years. Do we really need to continue it? Has it done any good? Should we stop it at this point? And this is really the first study to look at people living at home with their families in the severe state of Alzheimer's disease who, who had this, this question tested. So what, what happened here is that um, there were four, patients were, were divided into four treatment groups. One group who had been on Aricept was taken off Aricept and just given placebos. That's, that's this group here. And they declined over a one-year period the most. These other groups continued to get some treatment. So these two groups in the middle continued to get either Aricept or were taken off Aricept and put on the Menda. And the patients, this was done under blinded scientific conditions, so they didn't know what they were getting. They were just getting the same, the same pill, it all looked the same. But this group up here was kept on Aricept and Namenda was added. So it gets to the question, what's the value of adding Namenda even late in the treatment? And what it shows you, um, and it shows you that uh, th these patients are clearly doing better than anybody else. The patients who get Aricept and Namenda late in the disease for this one year period are clearly doing better than the people who got just one medicine, but everybody's doing quite a bit better than the people who were taken off the medicines. Now, you could argue about the statistical significance of this. You can argue about the clinical significance of it. Does it really make a big impact on people? And, and editorial writers have, have begun doing this already. But what you have to do clinically, if you're, if you're a caregiver working with somebody taking care of somebody that you care about who has Alzheimer's or, or a clinician working with that person is you have to think, you have to ask what, what are the possible things that might be changed by this difference and is this going to make a personal impact on this per patient their, and their family and make a difference in their lives. This graph, and it's confusing because now it's flipped over, so in this graph uh, up is now worse and down and, and, and Higher is worse and lower is better. But this looked at basic uh, uh, self-care, ability to, to wash yourself, use the bathroom yourself, change yourself, brush your teeth, and the like. And what you see is that the group that was taken off Aricept and got no medicine at all, they got much worse. They got much more impaired. They lost function faster than the group that continued on Aricept or got switched to Namenda. And the group that received both medicines uh, lost function the slowest. So if you think about this, this difference might be, can, can, can mom or dad still go to the bathroom by themselves? Can they still sit at the table and feed themselves using a knife and fork? Uh, and think about what that means day to day to, in a family life. That, that, that's the impact these medicines can have. Now, more telling, this is what's called a survival graph. And this shows, in a, in a clinical research study, um, patients during the study, and you, and you see this is a very this is a you know a, 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 about a year's worth of, of data here, that when people drop out of the study, they get they, they 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 get sick, they die, things go bad, people move away, whatever happens, they drop out. But often they drop out because things aren't going well. They're given a treatment, they don't know whether they're getting a placebo or an active drug. Things aren't going well, and they say, well, forget this. I'm going to go. I'm going to go to see the doctor down the street and get a treatment and, and maybe mom will do better. What you see here is that the patients who got no, were taken off Aricept and got no medicine, um, over two thirds of them dropped out. They got, they got fed up and they walked away. They said, I had it with this. Whereas the people who got both Aricept and Amenda, only a third of them dropped out. They were twice as likely to stick with the program. And you can take that as a measure that these people's caregivers are able to manage. Whatever's going on, it may not be great, but they feel they can carry on. Whereas these people have decided this is, this is no good, we gotta do something different. That, this is a very, very telling difference about the impact these treatments can make. Now, this projects data out with, with cholinesterase inhibitors over a, a five year period. And it compares what happens on average with treatment Patients get worse over time within this, this range compared 
to what's called a historical control. What the, the rate of decline we know that occurs in people who before there were treatment who never got treatment for Alzheimer's disease. And what you could see is these people get, get worse, and these people get worse. So you'd be inclined to think, well, so what? What's the difference? This really isn't a lot dramatic. But again, over a five-year period, the difference is the difference between where they would have been and where they are. And if we look at this black line and view this black line, is any outcome that's important to you or your family? So it can mean, again, you can still drive your car down to the drugstore, down to Dunkin' Donuts, down to the pharmacy, down to the supermarket. Uh, can stay home alone, uh, can still work the remote control on the TV, um, still remembers family members, um, hasn't gotten depressed yet, hasn't started to hallucinate, hasn't started to become violent with caregivers, isn't up at night, all night long, keeping everybody awake, isn't calling 911 50 times during the day. All the things that can happen that can make life untenable for, for patients and their caregivers. The effect of treatment is that patients reach this point where these symptoms emerge much later. So instead of it happening here, the people who got the treatment didn't have that happen till out here, and that difference is almost two years later. Huge, huge difference, um, if you think about it for a minute. So again, what outcomes are clinically important? Uh, well, treatment can both relieve behavioral symptoms and delay their onset, prevent them from emerging. Uh, treatment can preserve functional skills. Treatment can delay the need for nursing home placement. We, we found in these studies, we think that good aggressive treatment with medicine on average keeps people out of nursing homes about a year and a half longer than people who don't get treatment. You're going to hear a talk from Dr. King in a minute about caregiver interventions. The best research, and I hope I'm not um, stealing too much of your thunder here, but the best research done at NYU at a, at a nationally funded Alzheimer's research center has shown that psychological treatments for the caregiver do even more than that. They keep people out of a nursing home about 18 months or longer on average. And if we combine all those things, we sometimes can keep people out of long-term care so they never have to face dealing with that. Treatment can reduce care, the degree of caregiver burden. And there are very good studies that show that treatment make a difference. A caregiver burden is lessened with various kinds of treatment interventions. Treatment reduces the level of caregiver illness. Caregivers are much more vulnerable to get sick in a, in a whole host of ways. And various treatments for Alzheimer's disease keep caregivers healthier. Caregivers get sick, they can't function, and people are more likely to wind up in nursing homes. And more importantly, these interventions reduce healthcare utilization. So a simple intervention, a nurse practitioner trained in behavioral interventions who helps primary care physicians identify cases who can benefit and coaches families on behavioral interventions, cuts in half the number of visits those patients have to make to their primary care physician for physical problems. Dramatic end result, huge difference. Um, good results are not achieved with medicine alone. This is complicated stuff. It requires expertise, it's time intensive. You can't make a diagnosis, put somebody on a pill, and have them come back in a year. This requires a team effort of, 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 of uh, professionals working together along medical, psychiatric, um, psychological, and social lines to try to provide a very multi-dimensional, comprehensive approach to helping patients and their families cope with this illness and mitigate its impact. So we think that um, among, among all the things that we do medically, including very vigilant primary medical care, uh, good treatment of psychiatric and behavioral symptoms, Things that we do for patients, family members, and primarily their, their main caregiver that help them cope better make a huge, can make a huge impact and really mitigate the impact of this disease. So uh, I'll conclude by that and, and segue into our next talk, uh, which is going to focus on, on caregiver issues. Okay, thank you, Dr. Moak. That was terrific. Um, now we're going to hear from Dr. Brenda King, who's a lifelong resident of Worcester, and she has worked in local healthcare fields in various roles and capacities over the last 40 years. 
She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and a certificate in gerontology at our very own Assumption College and her master's and doctorate degrees in clinical and health psychology at Antioch College University. Dr. King worked for many years at Fallon Community Health Plan in roles providing care coordination and program coordination with the Medicare population. She worked in the Department of Medicare and Government Programs as the coordinator for senior health services, developing and coordinating programs for older adults, including programs for healthy, active seniors, frail elders with dementia, and other health conditions, and programs for caregivers. Dr. King was the clinical manager of the UMass Geriatric Psychiatric Psychiatry Consultation Project, which was a two-year pilot project through the Department of Psychiatry. And she now is uh, with the UMass Primary Care Patient-Centered Medical Home Program as a care advisor and she teaches at the Assumption, in the Assumption College in the Graduate School in Counseling Psychology. Her clinical interests include women's roles and mental health, the effects of stress on physical illness and chronic pain, and successful aging. It's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Brenda King. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everybody. Um, are we connected? Okay. I can just use the stage box. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I know that um, there are lots of professionals who are dedicated um, caregivers. However, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is um, family and um, informal caregivers. Because about two thirds of older patients, older persons with uh, long term care needs, um, rely exclusively on family, friends, neighbors um, to provide the care. When an individual, when an older individual who needs, who has long-term care needs, um, does not have family or friends or someone to take care of them, about 50% of those folks end up in nursing homes or long-term care. When a person needs, has long-term care needs and has family, friends, someone to take, to take care of them, 93% of those folks actually receive their care at home and in the community. So the, the great majority of of care is provided by family, friends, and um, neighbors sometimes. The role of caregiver is very multifaceted. Um, some people can, um, can engage in the caregiver role and serve all of these purposes, and sometimes it's broken up um, by different either family members or friends. There's, there's providing actual health care, changing dressings, um, giving medications, feeding. There's homemaking skills, um, vacuuming or grocery shopping, um, making sure that um, food is set out. The caregiver can, can be a friend or a companion, taking the, um, the elder out to maintain social contacts, to just sort of keep them from being isolated. Um, but and oftentimes the family caregiver is actually um, acts as a care manager, coordinating various and sundry cares as well. So um, a care tasks. So that sometimes the family caregiver um, assigns other family members to do various tasks. Sometimes it's keeping um, kind of coordinating um, uh, caregiving agencies, home health agencies, and um, other um, other types of caregiving. Um, as well as the family stuff. Um, and surrogate decision makers, uh, caregivers 
often, if they don't start out that way, often end up making um, legal decisions and financial decisions and healthcare decisions, um, having power of attorney or um, our healthcare proxy. The average caregiver is female. She's about 49. She's typically married with children, um, often children at home and children perhaps in college or on their way out of the house. Um, she's working outside the home at least 20 hours a week and earning about $35,000 a year. This is a person who is already stretched to the limit typically. And so um, adding the, um, the role of caregiver for an elder um, stretches, stretches her undoubtedly. Um, one of the, the big issues with providing caregiving it for women is since oftentimes the culture as well as women themselves see the role of caregiver as a woman's role, there's um, a, an assumption that women are better at it. There's an assumption that it comes naturally, that women can do it better than other folks, and those other folks are men. Um, so, um, and so what happens is that, that particularly women who um, really believe that caregiving reflects on them, on their role as a woman, um, this adds to the level of stress that caregivers feel. So it's not just, um, it's not just the tasks of caregiving, but it's, it's a sense of the responsibility uh, to the role of caregiver and to the role of being a woman. And so w one of the things that happens when, the, or one of the differences between um, male caregivers and women caregivers is that men have a tendency, because, possibly because some of the research says because they don't um, own the responsibility for being a caregiver, they, they stay men, um, but they see caregiving as being more task oriented. It's a job that needs to be done. It's an important job, um, but they don't own it as sort of a part of their character in the way that women do. So it doesn't add that level of internal responsibility and sense of stress um, to men oftentimes that it does to women. So in part, and because of that, women spend um, considerably more time actually providing the care um, for their elder than um, men uh, statistically do. So caregiving itself is stressful. And because of the, um, the activities and the tasks that need to be done, um, caregivers can be frustrated, angry, um, feel drained and guilty, helpless, and sort of have a sense of constant worry. There's a sense that there's always something left to do, something more to do, something that I haven't gotten to. One of the things that we know about stress is that the human body was um, not designed to, have, to live with chronic stress. We were designed to have an immediate stressor, respond to it, and then be able to get away from the stressor and have the, um, the stress response resolve. And so with caregiving, the stress is more chronic. So rather than having a stressor and then a resolution, we have the chronic stress and then it stays high. And so when that happens, the, um, the, the, the physical effects of stress, which in the moment can be motivating, it can sort of keep us on our game, can help us get, um, be enthusiastic and know what we're doing. Um, when we don't have a resolution to that stress and it stays, the stress stays high, we, um, we can find um, high blood pressure, high heart rate. Um, as anybody might know when you're under stress, um, the level of muscular tension, people have, you know, your neck, your back, sort of everything can be tight and hurt. Um, we also have decreased flexibility of blood vessels, which has implications for cardiac disease. So if the blood's not pumping as efficiently and our hearts and our, and our blood vessels aren't working as well. Um, impaired immune response. So we are susceptible to various um, infections and illnesses and decreased concentration and focus. So when the stress goes on, it continues, it, it depletes us and um, we have, um, we then can't function as, as we would like to. Um, because of the stress of, of caregiving and because of the tasks and the duties involved in caregiving, it also can result in lower self-esteem, a loss of self-identity, 
people become really kind of wrapped up in the role of caregiving and they sort of feel like they're always chasing some responsibility around caregiving. And so they lose a sense of their own um, activities and the things that they like to do and, um, and maybe things that they did do in the past. And so when that level of stress it continues, um, we tend to feel exhausted, unable to handle our responsibilities and sort of like everything's out of control. And so this escalates, this sort of snowballs, um, and we then have, we, in, 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 in an effort to try to help us manage this stress, we try to find shortcuts and ways to um, maybe get a little bit of time, maybe get a little bit of um, space just for ourselves. So what happens is, rather than going home after taking care of mother after working um, to cook dinner, we just stop, um, we uh, go through the drive through and pick up something that's not necessarily healthy. Or we decide that we don't have time to eat ourselves. Um, caregivers can often use um, a nice glass of wine at the end of the day to relax rather than something else that might actually um, be better for them. And what happens when we engage in these bad habits, they actually increase the physical stress that we have um, and they don't really deplete or, or decrease the stress that, um, that we are trying to um, decrease. And so as this all continues to sort of spiral, women become really um, susceptible to depression and anxiety. Women caregivers, almost six times more likely to, um, to have depression and anxiety than other folks. And again, as um, Dr. Moke had mentioned, caregivers are much more likely to um, have illnesses, chronic illnesses, and, um, and uh, infections and other, other illnesses. So they're more likely to get sick five or more times in a year. Um, when your immune system is, is low, you're likely to um, catch every bug that comes down the pike. Um, caregivers have higher levels of cholesterol, have acid, tend to have acid reflux and um, chronic diseases like heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And one of the things about chronic stress is it increases the intensity and the experience of chronic pain. So if a caregiver already has arthritis or low back pain or is, is dealing with some other kind of chronic pain, um, the stress itself, as well as the, the level of activity, increase the, um, the suffering and, um, of chronic pain and, and the, the physical sensations of chronic pain. So despite, though, um, the, this sort of snowballing effect of, of the stress and the activity and the, um, the sort of not um, effective coping skills um, that, it, that affects caregivers' health, just as, as caregivers tend not to have good, good habits that would help to um, lessen their stress, they also have, don't have good habits that would lessen their, um, their disease burden. So they're less likely to keep their own doctor's appointments and get screening tests. Um, they're less likely to exercise regularly, which could be really helpful in, de in decreasing stress. And they're less likely to fill their own prescriptions. So caregiving is extraordinarily stressful, and it ripples into um, other parts of people's lives as well. So where some, some female caregivers find um, increased meaning and a sense of purpose in caregiving, um, that can actually be sort of a, a bit of a, um, it can actually be a negative in sort of a paradoxical way. So it feels good to provide this kind of care and it feels like I'm doing something good and positive, but because of that, because of that small reward, I'm less likely to actually do the things that I need to do to decrease my stress. So, um, so the stress kind of continues and the effects of caregiving um, burden filter into all aspects of life. So, um, so caregivers have higher levels of conflict and, um, and difficulty with family members, spouses, um, friends, neighbors. Um, but it also, it also spills into women's work life. And so female caregivers are more likely to um, either cut down their hours at their, at their job or quit altogether or retire early. Um, and when that happens, 
though the implications of that is our financial implications for the longer term. So that women are much um, less likely to end up with promotions or other benefits and they're less likely to receive their pensions. So the burden of caregiving and the burden of the care of caregiving stress um, goes on longer than um, just the actual caregiving itself. This, the effects of a diagnosis of, of uh, dementia can impact the family for as long as 20 years from when the diagnosis is first made. So the, the stress starts when you're sort of wondering, what are we going to do? How are we going to manage this? What's going to happen? What kind of things can we expect? And, and studies show that um, caregivers continue to be affected um, by the, the levels of stress and feelings of depression even three to four years after the person with dementia has died. So when, with all of this, the stress sort of compounding um, itself with the activities that are, that are necessary for caregiving as well as the emotional um, and psychological burden, um, caregivers feel overwhelmed, anxious, and depressed, and they're less likely to respond to their um, elder, the loved one with dementia. So they're less likely to be able to handle the behaviors. They respond in ways that aren't effective and aren't helpful. Um, and when caregivers feel unable to manage dementia behaviors, they're more likely to need to have, have to uh, transfer the care to a nursing home. The problem is that nursing home placement does not typically reduce caregiver stress, and it can even increase it. So the caregiver tends to um, feel guilty, tends to not believe that the care that their loved one is receiving in the nursing home is as good as they could, um, that they could provide on their own. Um, and that can, that can create conflicts with the nursing home staff. Um, but what happens often is that um, caregivers who have sort of relinquished the care of their loved one to the nursing home um, haven't actually done that. What, what happens is they often spend a lot of time at the nursing home. So they're, they're sort of after work or on their time off are spending as much time um, doing the care in the nursing home as they would have or maybe did um, when the person was home. So what do we do? Elder care services, resources, um, community agencies can make a big difference in helping um, with the tasks of caregiving. Um, some of the actual just time consuming and the physical tasks um, can be sort of farmed out to home health agencies or adult day programs. Those can be a real um, lifesaver for families. Information and education programs can help when people have the information and sort of know what to expect and have, um, have ways to kind of um, figure out what does this mean for me. That can make a big difference in how they cope and how they see the situation and make plans for what they need to do. And support groups. Um, support groups can provide peer support. They can provide a sense of less isolation. But one of the things that I've found with families is that sometimes um, support groups can be hard for people, particularly in the early stages, because listening to other people's stories can sometimes actually be scarier for people. So it's something to keep in mind um, if you're considering a support group. Um, so one of the things, one of the services that is available that a lot of people don't think about for caregivers is actual psychotherapy, professional counseling. People sort of think or expect that, that other people are going to think that um, if, I, if I get therapy, that's going to mean I'm crazy um, or I'm not depressed. I don't have any, any big particular psychological issue. The thing is that, um, that psychotherapy can really help the caregiver manage um, the, the stress of caregiving and, and help to, um, to create positive change. Um, Psychotherapists who work particularly with cognitive behavioral therapy, um, that it's a particular type of therapy that is really helpful and, and effective in, for a lot of disorders, but, but for helping um, stress and, and creating change. So cognitive behavioral therapy is unlike the sort of um, stereotyped idea of therapy. It's not about lying on a couch. It's not about talking about what it, what it was like um, when you were a child and, and talking about your mother. It's about what's going on now. It might be talking about your mother, but it's about what's going on now. So um, it's, it's focused on the present. It's time limited. 
and it's problem solving. It's, it can be very structured and it can be very um, clear about, about what it is that, that you're working on. It's not a lot of chit chat and, and um, just sort of um, having somebody be there to sort of make you feel better. Um, cognitive theory is, the, the theory is that our perceptions um, influence our feelings and our behaviors. And so the, ther the therapy itself helps to identify thoughts and beliefs that negatively affect what we're, the behaviors that we're engaging in, the relationships that we're um, involved in, and how we see our world and, and what we need to do. And so the theory is that when we think more realistically, we feel better and our stress is reduced. I'm going to skip that one. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy can help with individual um, counseling, family counseling, or programs that are geared to you know, larger groups but have the, um, the particular theory um, uh, for the intervention. So, um, and they've been shown to improve well-being, reduce feelings of stress from the caregiver burden, and decrease disruptive behaviors by the person with dementia. So CBT can help increase caregivers' ability to manage problem dementia behaviors, increase satisfaction with social support, caregiver burden, and depression. And um, Dr. Moak, you did, you clearly um, outpaced me because my research said almost a year. You said 18 months. So, um, so studies show that uh, clearly at least a year um, can, um, some families in, in studies have delayed the, um, the nursing home placement by a year and, as Dr. Moak said, 18 months when they're involved with cognitive behavioral treatments for, for individual caregivers or families. So the, the skills that people learn are really helpful for managing the behaviors and helping them to keep their, care, their um, loved one home. So some of the goals that um, cognitive behavioral uh, the cognitive behavioral uh, treatment helps people with are finding more time for their own activities, um, competence in dealing with aggression, they, how to receive how to get more support from your family and um, and around caregiving, dealing more effectively with um, the changes in your life, and having fewer conflicts with other family members um, around caregiving. CBT helps caregivers learn relaxation techniques to identify patterns of thinking um, that, that add to stress and frustration. Strategies to find effective ways to ask for and receive help. And then communication styles that can be more effective for, with the person with dementia. And so what can happen is the, when the a caregiver is able to um, to think more clearly and have and have feel that she, she's got more resources and behave and have communication skills that help um, w with the dement the person with dementia the behaviors of the person with dementia decrease and they're less they can be less problematic and they can be less aggressive. So, what do we do? Caregivers have no time; they can't leave the person alone, and when when the caregiver does have some time, all she really would like to do is to be able to um, have some time to herself or maybe take a rest or um, just generally feel better herself. Um, what I tell people is with cognitive behavioral treatment, some of the things that we work on are, are um, relaxation techniques. And if we know that... Um, that a one-minute exercise of, of breathing techniques that are associated with meditation, um, that diaphragmatic breathing, um, if we have six deep breaths within one minute of a particular type of breathing, within one minute, research shows decreased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, and decreased stress hormones in the blood. One minute, six breaths. If cognitive behavioral therapy can teach that, that that you can have one minute where you can actually change the physiological um, results of stress, then that is gonna help to give something 
add to your resources for caring for your elder. And so having finding a way to have an hour every other week or, an, or every week for a set period of time can be a really good investment. So it doesn't take a lot, but it does take a different way of thinking about what's going on so that you can find the time and find ways to, um, to make the space in your life. Um, some of, some of the, the quotes I have of the um, um, important philosophers up here are, um, I put up here because my, my feeling is that whatever it takes that clicks for you to say the right thing, whatever works for you. Um, I tend to say to people, you can fill someone else's cup only if you have enough in your pitcher to give. If you don't have enough, you can't give. And it doesn't matter what that is, and it doesn't matter how that is. Um, if, if you are not able to, if everything that you're doing for caregiving is making you sick, then you're not going to be able to provide caregiving. And it's clear, because you, you're going to have to eventually transfer the care to someone else. And that's not going to help you, even when that happens. So, so acting now as if it's sort of an emergency and taking care of something for you is the way to do it. And so um, the other thing that I like to say is, like, if you were in a tin can in the sky and you're being taught what to do when that tin can starts to fall from the sky, um, airline attendants will say, if you don't take the time to breathe first, you can't help those who need you. So your tin can might not be falling from the sky yet, but it very well might, and it might soon. So the best thing that you can do is breathe first. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, now we're uh, ready to take some questions. Thank you uh, to all the speakers. So, uh, the speakers, we'd like to just come up here and I'll give you some microphones. You can pass them on. Questions? There's got to be some questions. Can you stand up and speak so everybody can hear? Uh, so uh, PET scans have been avail available as a research tool for quite some time and were approved by Medicare for the diagnosis of dementia where uh, two or more special dementia specialists, neurologists, geriatric psychiatrists, have been unable to make a diagnosis clinically, usually uh, uh, discerning the difference between a form of Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia that Dr. Brown mentioned. Specifically, that's, that's the indication where it's covered, when you can't really tell the difference. So PET scans are available and are being used to some extent for that purpose now. The data don't show that they really change the course of, of most Alzheimer's disease care but given earlier. Early diagnosis can be made clinically and should be made clinically. The holy grail in the field regarding PET scans is the use of PET scans with a uh, coupled with what are known as biomarkers and then specialized imaging technologies um, using a, a substance for example called Pittsburgh compound B which actually labels the amyloid that gets deposited in the brain that Dr. Brown was talking about so the idea is that you can you can have a scan that shows abnormal levels of amyloid being deposited years and years before the clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease are apparent, and combining that perhaps with other types of images such as MRI scans and biomarkers, measuring things that are present, tau protein and the amyloid, uh, beta amyloid 42 that Dr. Brown mentioned that can be found in the spinal fluid, 
the diagnosis uh, possibly can be made years and years before clinical symptoms are apparent. And then once we can do that and we have a treatment that makes a difference, the future of the field will be identifying people at risk in their 40s and 50s and beginning to initiate treatment at that point, maybe with vaccines that will pre prevent them from ever getting the disease. Oh boy, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, as I said in, in my introductory remarks, uh, the National Alzheimer's Plan is now calling for a cure or something like a cure, an effective treatment by 2025. I think the research has been accelerating in a very exciting way in the last few years and the field is really changing rapidly. But if you follow the, um, what's going on in terms of some of the clinical trials with newer medicines, and particularly some of the, the vaccines and immunotherapies, the progress in terms of treatment has been very disappointingly slow. So I, I really don't know. I don't think anybody really knows at this point. Another question? Come on, you have to have some questions. You want to stand up and? Um, this is for um, Dr. Kuhn, Dr. Wolf, primarily. Um, with an oncoming tsunami, Uh, well, you, you've hit the nail right on the head. Um, there, there will not be enough neurologists or uh, geriatric psychiatrists or even geriatricians who can be very good at this as well. Uh, and in fact, uh, numbers of those subspecialists are losing ground to the gr growth of the elderly population. And there was a report um, published by the Institute of Medicine just in 2008 looking at the workforce issues and, and really identified it in 2008 as an emergency, and we really have not, we've lost ground since then. Um, Dr. Zadonis and I recently sat in a meeting with people here at UMass looking at ways that um, we can collaborate in our efforts to try to support this kind of work in primary care, but uh, linking over to what Dr. King is doing these days, in order to make that happen, we need a different model of service delivery because primary care physicians right now, the way primary care is set up, just cannot, cannot do the job. They're, they're beleaguered. Um, you know, one study, for example, showed the average primary care physician takes about two minutes to talk with an older patient about depression. You know, so uh, when you think, when you have to deal with uh, the diabetes, the hypertension, the arthritis, the Parkinson's disease, the asthma, and someone's on 12 different medicines, and, and there's a urinary infection, and they've got Alzheimer's disease and some depression, and you've got about 10 or 12 minutes to deal with all that, it's impossible. So we really need to, it's all going to depend on what's evolving nationally in healthcare reform and where that goes, but um, medical homes and other innovative programs like PACE programs clearly are the direction of the future that will, will eventually make a difference. You had a question up there? Would you just repeat the question? Uh, the question was, as the disease progresses and psychiatric and behavioral symptoms escalate in severity and, and frequency, including sleep disorders and, and psychiatric symptoms, uh, paranoid symptoms, aggressive symptoms that, that uh, Dr. King mentioned, uh, could we touch upon the psychopharmacology of it? Well, there's a, there's a, a Pandora's box that you've opened. Um, that whole area is even more controversial than the area of, of medicines for the Alzheimer's disease itself, um, and, and even more misunderstood. Uh, let me say a couple things. Um, I think her most important point is that behavioral treatments for caregivers can reduce behavioral symptoms in the patients, and we think that behavioral symptoms for both reduce the, reduce the frequency of the, and severity of those symptoms and the need for psychopharmacologic interventions we also think that early treatment with anti-dementia drugs, the four that I mentioned, reduce 
reduce the emergence of psychiatric symptoms that will require medicines. Now, sometimes medicines are needed and they're unavoidable. And, and the problem is that they're often not used judiciously or wisely. People get in trouble because of that. And that gets, that gets into the, uh, uh, the comment that was just made before about the workforce issues. The problem is we don't have enough healthcare providers of all types who are skilled in either behavioral and environmental treatments or the use of psychiatric medicines to use them in a safe, effective way. And this is going to be an increasing problem as we have more and more older people with dementia and our healthcare system is not tooling up to deal with it. So we, we lose a lot of sleep. The, the, the program that, that Dr. King and I were involved with um, a few years ago uh, was a pilot project here at, at UMass in the Department of Psychiatry to try to provide consultation to primary care physicians around these issues. And we did that for, for two years, actually with support from the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. Um, and uh, achieved some great successes, but learned a, long, a lot along the way how difficult this is by the amount of times we weren't able to make a big difference. Yes? I'm not used to using one of these. Um, thank you very much for your discussion. It's been very helpful. It's a general questions, two questions. One is once an Alzheimer's patient has gone to a nursing home um, and perhaps you have a caregiver who isn't recognizing some of these signs and symptoms and issues that you've brought to our attention this evening, how can family members or are there resources for the family members to be supportive of that caregiver? Where would you direct us as family members of the caretaker? to start seeking help in order to be more effective with the person with Alzheimer's. That's one. And the second part of my, or another question is, for family members of an Alzheimer's patient, at what point do you say, gee, I should be screened? Um, you know, do I go be screened? That kind of thing. Thank you. Take the second part of that question first. Yeah, sure. So. Um, the situation now is that there are clear genetic tests that can be done, which are well-defined uh, either causes of or risk factors for AD. Uh, the dilemma is that none of them at this point has any implication for therapeutic or lifestyle intervention or change. And so it ultimately then becomes a personal decision based on any one of a number of personal factors as to whether or not one wants to proceed with testing. There are some, for example, who may be thinking about family planning, uh, in, in whom that kind of information could be very important. Uh, there are others who may be thinking about the financial implications of decision making, uh, but in the end, it's it's a highly a personal matter. I, we desperately uh, hope that, in fact, the situation will change and that there will be specific interventions that will be meaningfully applied when there are specific genetic contacts. So, for example, one of the exciting things that's happened at UMass is that uh, technologies have been discovered uh, for uh, affecting the way a toxic gene uh, can have a negative impact on a cell. In fact, there are technologies that are being tried and work in animals to turn off a toxic gene so it no longer makes a toxic uh, protein and therefore is no longer harmful. Um, um, and I can also tell you that there are studies very close to human intervention to try those in diseases like Huntington's disease and ALS. Um, so, so the hope is that not too terribly far down the line uh, there will be uh, interventions that might make a big difference if one carries one of these disease genes. And in fact, one might, um, with a lot of risk, make the suggestion that it may be the uh, inherited forms of these diseases which are the first to be treated because the technologies for silencing these adverse genes are really becoming of age. Um, but other than that, it's highly personal, which emphasizes again the need uh, for, 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 I think, for counseling, not, not even so much for just the psychological impact of of, of the information, but just for explaining what the data mean. Because again, a negative is sometimes very hard to interpret as as, as is a positive. That's a kind of long-winded answer. I don't know if it addresses your question. But I, I wonder if I could ask you a follow-up to clarify something in my mind. So my understanding is that if we, we think about people with late-onset Alzheimer's disease, which is the vast majority of, 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 of cases and affects the vast majority of families who, who wonder should they get screened, if the genetic test that's relevant is whether you have is the ApoE test and whether you have the ApoE, the form known as ApoE4. So my understanding is that 
if you test, the problem with getting tested is a test doesn't tell you whether you're going to get Alzheimer's disease or not. The APOE4 only, only tells you what your risk might be. So there are people who don't have APOE4 who end up getting Alzheimer's disease and people who do who don't get it. And that, that becomes a problem. Is that? Is that yeah. No, I totally agree. And, and, and even beyond that, um, when one has a positive result, the question is, is the positive uh, an intermediate or a full positive, depending on whether it's one chromosome or both chromosomes that are involved. So what's the dose? And then beyond that, there's the additional factor that the implications of the positive test may vary with uh, essentially ethnicity, uh, with age, and so forth. Uh, I mean, it I think can be said accurately that the chance of anyone in this room getting Alzheimer's disease over the lifetime is maybe 10 or 12 percent, something like that, just, just for any one of us. For someone who has two copies of the adverse APOE allele, it may be as high as 60 or 70 percent. Um, but that's a huge difference in between, and that 70% has to be put in quotes because it's highly variable, depending on any one of a number of factors that I think are not well understood. So it's really quite imprecise uh, at, at this time. Do you want to answer the second, first part of that question? Sure, sure. Um, when we're talking about families uh, caring for other family members, you're talking about other family members recognizing symptoms in a caregiver. Um, my advice would be um, the first thing, particularly if sort of non-threatening, would be to check out um, the familycaregiver.org or website, which gives a lot of um, um, fact sheets and information that's that's very sort of clear. It's it's in the resources that that we've put on the table. Um, but that would be sort of the first the, the first suggestion that I would have because it's it's not very threatening. So the idea that Care, you know, family members might say, "Gee, you know, you seem really stressed, and it's and you've been overwhelmed for a while. I wonder if you could use some help." That is going to really, I'm sure, be a welcome remark, um, and the, the caregiver is going to, you know, sort of just jump right at the idea to have her family think she's crazy. So, um, so a lot of times, what can happen is just having information and being able to see sort of bullet points that. That, that she's not alone, that this is not unusual, um, you know, behavior or feelings or um, situation can be, can be really helpful for people. Um, as I said, it, the tables downstairs, there's a, there's a resource table, a caregiver resource table with um, booklets and some resource lists for um, therapists who are able to see caregivers um, and, and use the techniques that actually can be helpful. Um, but also there are some websites too, and and again I think sometimes doing something, you know, starting off with something like just informational, general information, can be a lot less threatening and it can be a lot easier for the family to hand over as well. You know, I came across this at this meeting, and it can be a lot easier and less threatening all around. So, more questions? Yes. There are different. There are different approaches. Um, some of them are congregate housing, where people live in their own either rooms or small apartments, and have, um, have professional caregivers kind of keeping track of more than um, more than one person. Um, there are foster care. Um, for adults, uh, you know, grandparents sort of foster care um, programs where people go into other people's homes either for the day or you know for various periods of time. Um, I haven't heard particularly of a group home per se, which sounds an awful lot like a nursing home, um, but um, I don't know if that um, sounds familiar to you. But there there are some other things being tried, um, which can help. Um, Oftentimes, it can help with the behaviors of, of the person with dementia, but uh, you know, it obviously um, provides some relief from the caregiver burden, too. Thank you. Another question? Yes. I had read before that 
um, of caregivers become as ill or more ill than the person they're taking care of. Is the statistic that high? That I don't. That was out of long-term care news out of Florida. I'm, I'm not sure about that statistic, but there actually is some, some scary data now showing that caregiving itself may increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh -huh. I can see that, yeah. and that. And that may be through the impact of stress on, on, on brain cell health that, that Dr. Uh, King was referring to. So there's a, there are, there's a huge category of drugs in the pipeline to tackle each of these different steps that are envisioned to be important, whether it's chaperoning a protein so it doesn't form a clump, whether it's quieting down excessive firing of a cell, whether it's boosting energy production. Um, and and the, the question is how to bring them through in an efficient and rapid manner and get them into clinical trial. One of the things we haven't talked about, although we had a little conference about this two weeks ago, in Boston is that because of some recent failures in the area of Alzheimer's disease and drug trials, uh, and for other reasons, it turns out that unfortunately uh, the, the pharmaceutical industry is actually walking away from uh, CNS research in general and certainly AD as a hot area uh, for research. And one of the things that uh, we're very concerned about is the question of what uh, issues in terms of policy at either the state or the national level uh, might be implemented to, in some way, make it more enticing for big pharma to come back into uh, the world of CNS, uh, essentially drug discovery, because uh, it's it's a uh, it, this is a huge issue. Uh, um, for some of the CNS diseases like Lou Gehrig's, the old argument has been that those are um, small populations and orphan diseases with a small market share and not very lucrative. All right, fair enough. But when we see the large, uh, essentially pharmaceuticals, beginning to pull back from something as important as Alzheimer's disease, it really, I think, requires that we rethink public policy issues, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is given um, sort of the complex information we hear about the role of genes in Alzheimer's disease and the fact that there are sometimes skipped generations where someone has it, someone doesn't in another generation, and someone might in the third generation. What kind of general statements can one make about genetic testing? I think I, I've re restated your question. And uh, I would just emphasize at the risk of um, being a little bit repetitive that it's, it's a very complicated issue. There are clearly... Um, some gene defects, which when present, have uh, probably 85 or 90 percent chance of causing the disease by the time one reaches the age of, say, uh, 75 or 80 years of age. There are others that set the stage, but by no means guarantee the disease will evolve. And then there's a whole host of subtle factors that can increase risk, uh, which are very difficult to define. Um, so what's very important as one contemplates genetic testing is sitting down with a counselor and saying, all right, what is my family structure like? Who in the family has had the disease? What does that tell me about the type of gene that might be implicated in my family? Um, and what in turn does that suggest about how the diagnostic testing might play out? Because these are very uh, important differences between the different types of genetic factors. So. Yeah. Howdy, good evening. Um, I know Alzheimer's doesn't have no age barrier, but how about in occupations? Do they have anything like, my dad was a firefighter. Um, that, so the question was, uh, is there any implications in terms of occupational background, in terms of risk of, of getting Alzheimer's disease? Um, I'm not sure, other than having been a prize fighter or a football player who got his bell rung too many times, there are specific jobs that create a greater risk. Uh, firefighters who have toxic, to toxic inhalation problems may be at greater risk. Uh, any, kind of, any kind of brain injury earlier in life 
creates a, a chance of developing symptoms of Alzheimer's earlier, later, if you're going to get it anyway, I think. Um, there is some data now showing, however, that lifetime uh, intellectual activity, so involvement in demanding intellectual work, uh, educational activities, mentally demanding artistic and recreational activities, it, to some extent it may be preventive, that people that's, that, that use their minds and their brains more throughout life have a lower rate of developing Alzheimer's disease than people who uh, use their, their minds throughout life less. So you can then sort of figure out what that might mean for your, your lifestyle and the kind of work you do and what that means in terms of your risk. Uh, the data is, is, is association data. It's hard to, to draw cause and effect conclusions about it. And it's hard to know. It doesn't mean that if you, if you, um, you know, do menial work your entire life, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. And if you're a nuclear physicist, you're not. But uh, using your mind throughout life, engaged in demanding, challenging mental activities, seems to be somewhat protective. We don't quite know why. But it, but it actually may be that that challenging mental activity may stimulate brain cell the mechanisms in brain cells that or ordinarily clear the amyloid protein. Because uh, we're all making amyloid protein all the time, and our brains are, are clearing it all the time. And what, what seems to go wrong in, in Alzheimer's disease is the, the, the balance between formation of the protein and clearing it becomes skewed. Do you have any more thoughts about that? I just had a quick question. Um, Dr. Mocha, I think you said that um, many or most, the majority of Alzheimer's cases are diagnosed or are late onset. Is that what you said? That most, uh, I guess I'm wondering, how do you define late onset? Well, that's a really great question. And um, we may have different opinions about that or different, there are different ways to think about it. So if you look at, at how it's formally differentiated in the American Psychiatric Association's um, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, late onset is defined as over 65 and early onset is before, by 65 or earlier. But if you look at, at the pathology, and you may have uh, early onset cases, particularly those involving mutations in the presenilin genes, are people that often get the disease in their late 40s and early 50s. So, so it really may be that, that those early onset cases are people that, that get a, you know, much earlier than 65. One more question? Pardon. Two more questions. One here and one here. Hi, could you just address if a relative has Down syndrome, uh, what's the percentage um, in terms of them developing uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, and would that be early onset or late onset? I, I mean, I can comment very briefly. Um, I'm not trying to give you the exact numbers, but there's clearly uh, an uh, increased incidence of early onset uh, Alzheimer's-like disease and Down syndrome. And it's thought to be related, again, to this beta amyloid protein, because in Down syndrome, the chromosome, uh, which has an extra copy, uh, happens to be the chromosome where there lives the gene that makes that beta amyloid. And so throughout the lifetime of an individual with Down syndrome, there's 50 percent too much of, of the protein. Um, and we know from uh, various reasons that that alone suffices to dramatically increase the likelihood of getting Alzheimer's disease. So it, it's, it's, it's um, a, a substantial increase. I can't give you an exact percentage. Last question. Okay. Hi. I hope you can hear me. My name is Marie. I live here in Worcester all my life, and I want to thank you all for everything. It's been very helpful. But what I wanted to talk to you about is we talk about early signs of this disease. I have a friend who's in her 70s, she went to her primary care doctor, and I guess they did a CAT scan on her, and she went back for the uh, results. And this primary care doctor said to her, you have early, early signs of Alzheimer's, okay? And he told her she was not to drive her car anymore, and he was going to report her to the registry to make sure she didn't drive the car anymore. But... He didn't put her on any medicine or anything for this. And she came home wanting to commit suicide because this, you know, what, what kind of a primary care doctor has, I know doctors, you know, they're a 
good doctors, medium doctors, bad doctors. <laughs> this is a bad doctor with no bedside manner, not to talk bad about doctors, but I mean, what kind of doctor would say this to his patient? She, she came home so devastated. And uh, is there someone like a uh, specialist in this uh, she could go to? I told her, I said, you need to tell your doctor you want to go 